Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us once again, Fading Memories listeners. As always, I so appreciate you giving us some time today, and today is definitely going to be worth it because I have Dr. Elizabeth Landsverk. Did I get it? Got it. (laughs) I told her I'd probably butcher it because it looks harder than it is. And you guys know me, good at butchering names. She has a new book, newish book called Living in the Moment, Overcoming Challenges and Finding Moments of Joy in Alzheimer's Disease and Other Dementias. There it is. Ooh, that's a, that, there you go. I was just about to hold it up too. And today we're going to talk about a few things, a, mostly medications and when they're appropriate, when they're not. But we're going to touch on a few other things. And then I think I'm going to have her back to talk about how to get help because that's another great topic. And she and I could probably talk for hours and I know you don't have that kind of time. So thank you for joining me. I'm just going to call you Elizabeth because that's that's my daughter's middle name. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) So you are a geriatrician and we were talking before recording that there are not enough of you because... Your, your, let's see, how do we say this? Your, the way you guys practice is, is less procedural. Is that correct? It's often less procedural and it's less prestigious than being a cardiologist or, you know, a, a cancer specialist. Um, but I've got to say, so there's only 3,500 practicing geriatricians in the country and they're, you know, located more in the metro areas. I thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me on your show. I want to get out good information to the other areas. Like my family comes from upstate Minnesota, Kansas, you know, Nebraska. There aren't that many, you know, uh, geriatricians there. And there are parts of the country where they're saying, well, you know, Dr. Landsver, you know, we just don't have doctors. We have a nurse practitioner here. So what I'm trying to do between my website, drlizgeriatrics.com, a book, and we've got a uh, training program for people to get CEUs um, for either residential care or social workers, nurses, those sorts of things. And then forums uh, and telehealth is trying to get more information out to more people. So I've spent the last 18 years doing house calls, mainly for the most complicated uh, elders who are housebound um, in the San Francisco Bay area. Actually, they didn't have to be housebound, but many of them were. They just had to have medical and behavioral problems that other doctors hadn't taken care of in the previous, you know, three or five years. So, Do you also see a, a need for maybe a specialty in cognitive impairment diseases? That obviously is not just Alzheimer's and dementias, but maybe autism and there's probably other other causes of cognitive issues that I'm thankfully not aware of. Right. So there actually already are. So for it's the geriatricians, which are the medical specialists taking care of people over the age of 65. Um, And we take care of the whole gamut. We take care of osteoporosis. We take care of, you know, staying strong. We take care of cancer screening and dementia screening and, you know, making sure that the medications that you're on are the right ones that you're, you know, don't have too many medications and, then, you know, we also address pain and overall goals of care. So we, and then on the flip side for the autism, there's developmental pediatrics. And I have a friend who's the head of, who was the head of that at uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. So there, it's probably fairly similar. Um, there aren't as many as, as is needed, but um we're here. <laughs> we just need to get the message out. And, you know, I'm so excited. I've, my book has been out for two months and I've had a lot of interest in it. Um, I think what's out there right now is, you know, the 36 hour day and then some books written by spouses and nurse practitioner or nurses or social workers. And they all have good information. And a lot of them have, well, here's my experience and here's what to ask the doctor. And so what I'm trying to put out there is here's what the doctor should be thinking. Here's what the doctor should look for. Here are medications that can be helpful. Here are medications that cause problems. Here are situations 
where you might not have a diagnosis of dementia, but it's probably there. Here's what you do with financial abuse. Here's what you do when you need more help at home or you're feeling overwhelmed and those sorts of things. Down to here's what you do at the end of life and with hospice and what to you know look for in a hospice agency. So try to do a what to expect when you're expecting for dementia. <laughs> Which is a perfect title, actually, mm-hmm. um, to, for, for your second one. And I can attest, because I did read it, that it is very comprehensive and covers pretty much everything, considering everybody with some kind of form of dementia is different. It's difficult to cover everything, but you did a really good job on that. So I highly recommend picking it up. It's linked in the show notes. You guys always know I do that. So one of the, re- when we first started emailing way back, I don't know when, yeah. <laughs> long time ago, uh, we talked about um, medications and, mm-hmm. you know, when, when to use them, when not to use them. My dad, as many listeners probably know, he was diabetic and he was on, I think at the end of his life, well, not during hospice, but prior to hospice, at the end of his life was like 20 different, 26 different pharmaceuticals. When he came out of the hospital, um, he was there for 32 days because he needed to go back on dialysis. That was not what he wanted. I did not realize that was the problem. We're not going to discuss his nephrologist because I still would like to kill her. Um, anyway, oh, sorry, Siri's probably listening. And because she knew what was going on and she knew what he wanted. Well, and actually, she... you know what? Mm-hmm. It's a teaching moment, man. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I see this a lot. So there is, you know, the the conflict of the doctor sees the blood test going, oh, well, we have to do it. You know, we have to do an invasive procedure for X because this is not good. But the goals of care are dad doesn't want anything more invasive. You know, dad wants to be supported. Um, and how do you address it so you don't end up having your loved one go through procedures that they don't want, you don't want, and the doctor just said, oh, no, you have to have it. Um, I would say getting, uh, if you can, a care manager to help because often they kind of know how to to massage the situation and then have a meeting to talk about it and just say, you know, no, this is not what, you know, was the goals of care of my dad. Um, We would like a palliative consult. So that's, you know, an easier way to sidestep it instead of saying, you're not listening to us at all. You know, we need another doctor, but there isn't another doctor. So we're stuck with you. Um, But to say, we want a palliative consult to be consistent with the goals of care. So just, I just wanted to put that in. Well, no, that's actually really helpful. And just so you know how the story goes. So he, he had a donated kidney that he didn't Mm -hmm. care for. Well, frustrating. I don't understand how you do that, but that's his choice. He, the toxins in in his body built up to the point where he had memory issues. So I had a mom with advanced Alzheimer's and my dad, who thought it was 1998 in November of 2016, he was in the hospital for 32 days and his memory cleared up to the point where he knew he had a gap. And I'm not sure how they did that because that didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. But the, his nephrologist, which for those who aren't familiar, lucky you, is a kidney doctor. And she knew what he wanted. They, she'd been yeah. his nephrologist a long time. She called me up and said, okay, now you're going to have to drive your dad to dialysis three days a week. You're going to have to sit there with him. And I'm like, whoa, 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 time out. I had just literally turned 50 in November, 2016. Still had my photography business. And it's like, um, excuse me, but you know, this is not what he wanted. So I said, um, you know, we're, we're venturing into a very dark gray area of not, re- um, what is the right word? Not, um, ah, the word is slipping my brain. Okay. Um, it's not respecting his, um, right. You know, his not respecting, uh, his choices, you know, his advanced directive, it was written down. Right. And so I said, if this is the case, you know, that he needs to be babysat essentially during dialysis, then I guess we need to start discussing hospice. You want to know what I heard? No, what? Click. Hung up on me. Wow. Now you know why I want to still kill her. <laughs> well, so so here, you know, the only thing I can think of that would make that kind of understandable would be is if she didn't understand that you were a durable power of attorney for him and recognizing that he 
had lost his ability. So this is this that's in the book, you know, all the, the pre-planning to kind of when your loved one can make their decisions, have everyone get together and have your loved one tell everyone what they want, what they wouldn't want, and then choose an agent, a durable power of attorney for finances and for medical. So if you can't make your decisions, the next person is deputized to do it because if you're not, the doctors are going to cut you off. I mean, there's probably more going on to it than that, but you know, that was, you know, one of the things that I, I would um, think about. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. That is just so painful. Um, but if we want to talk about the medications for elders and those with dementia, you know, when someone's been in the hospital, particularly if they've had dementia, particularly if they've been getting kind of agitated, um, what I often see is they give them Ativan. They give them Ativan, which is in the Valium, uh, the Valium family, and they give it to them to keep them from being restless, from being agitated or from not sleeping. And the problem with that is that it's addictive, that if you've had it, you know, I had one little lady who got just sleeping pills similar to Ativan uh, Restoril for three nights and I had gotten her meds all straightened out. She'd been really, really kind of agitated, but she uh, tore all the skin off her chest and I wanted them to evaluate whether they should do a skin graft. Well, they decided not to do it. Um, but they gave her a sleeping pill without telling me they discharged her. And that next night, this is after only three nights of sleeping pills. She was awake at midnight. She was agitated. She was yelling. She was aggressive. She was delirious from the withdrawal from just a sleeping pill for just three days. So even though, you know, doctors usually say, well, you can't get addicted to the Ativan or anything like that for unless it's been, you know, two to four weeks. People with dementia, it can happen sooner. And what often happens is in the hospital, they give the Ativan and then they discharge it and they're like, oh, no, you shouldn't have it as an outpatient. So they just stop it. And then they go through the withdrawal delirium. They get more agitated and they go up, oh, worse dementia, better refer to hospice. Um, so that's, you know, like my number one um, cause to get the message out. The second one is that um, we don't treat pain. We don't treat pain in any way. I mean, you know, let alone the people with dementia, God bless them. They, they are more likely to get agitated and not be able to locate, you know, that it's back pain because they've been sitting in a wheelchair all day. I've seen people who uh, elders who don't have dementia, who have bone on bone arthritis or spinal stenosis and can barely move. And they're like, yeah, you can have some Motrin, yeah. <laughs> you can have some Motrin when you need it. And what the doctors, you know, aren't acknowledging or not aware of is that Motrin and Naproxen are more dangerous than a half a tablet of Norco twice a day if you treat the constipation. Because the biggest side effect I've seen from the low dose Norco or acetaminophen and hydrocodone, uh, they don't have the Norco brand anymore, but I call it Norco because it's shorter, um, is Serious constipation, which I've seen a couple bowel perforations. That's serious. So if you treat for, for constipation, you're taking care of the serious pain without trying to sedate the agitation. And if you use the Motrin or the Naproxen, you increase the risk of heart attacks, strokes, high blood pressure, kidney failure, uh, and edema, uh, and heart failure. It's not a safer medication. Elders should not be on those medications. Just like choice. your 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 typical over the counter like Motrin or Yep, that that can get you in trouble. And I see doctors ordering it all the time. Now, a good over the counter is the Tylenol. You know, if I like the long acting one that lasts 8 hours, not 4 hours, uh, you take one in the morning at breakfast, one in the morning at dinner. Only people with liver failure or alcoholics shouldn't have it, but of course, Anything you hear on this show, or if you hear it on my website, drlizgeriatrics.com, check with your doctor. But a Tylenol twice a day, every day can really cut down the pain. And I've found, well, it's, it's demonstrated by studies that if you cut down the pain for someone with dementia, you will cut down the agitation without sedating them with, with pills. That makes sense. I get pretty nasty when I'm uncomfortable. And I've experienced the um painkiller with the uh basically stool softener pet med chaser yeah. was in 2016 i flew off my bike and broke my collarbone Ouch. so i have a metal plate yeah 
not nope. fun. <laughs> not how I wanted to spend the summer, that's for sure. Yeah. And literally the constipation, even with the medication to treat it, was worse than the pain in my my arm, my shoulder, my collarbone. So there was one morning I was like, mm, nope, not taking this crap anymore. <laughs> well, so col- so a stool softener or colase is just garbage. You know, the, the good ones are, it, and, and you can find all this on my website, drlizgeriatrics.com slash medications. But um, Senna, Senecot's a good one to help you move your bowels. And Miralax. Mm. Those are my I don't remember. Foods. This was a prescribed one. I don't remember what it was, but yeah, it wasn't helping. Not enough anyway. <laughs> Oh, but it did get me. It get, did get me off the narcotic for the pain, because it was not it was not worth the trouble. And so I think I just took Tylenol after that. My daughter has Crohn's disease, so the Tylenol yeah. is all she should take. Right. So that's all our household has. Not that she lives with us anymore, but just well, a habit. Well, so here's here's something interesting. So there's that category, but then there's another category of nerve pain. And when I hear Crohn's disease or I hear spinal stenosis with abdominal pain or I hear sciatica. Um, How about shingles? The, well, shingles, the, the gabapentin is FDA approved for that, but the orthopedists use it for nerve pain, peripheral neuropathy, sciatica. Um, and I found that, you know, with osteoporosis, you can have vertebral compression and it can pinch the nerves and cause abdominal pain. So I've given um, gabapentin for abdominal pain, for irritable bowel disease. So that or the pregabalin, the Lyrica, is less sedating and it can be more effective for nerve pain, but it, it's expensive and it's hard to get. So um, if it's nerve pain, you need a different category of medication. So that might be something you you know suggest that your daughter's doctor uh, look into. Yeah. Fortunately she doesn't, she's, she gets, um, an infusion every month that keeps her system from attacking her, her, from her system attacking itself. I don't think she has pain, which is interesting is, I mean, she has days when she get you know, it gets, things get irritated, but Mm -hmm. everybody's system, it's just hers is worse. But I had a dog with severe nerve arthritis in his back legs and he was on gabapentin but when I got shingles, they gave me Motrin. That's Didn't wrong. Help at all. So, so I know. <laughs> that is completely wrong. That is the one thing that gabapentin is FDA approved for. Yeah, they re- <laughs> she recommended it after I messaged her. It'd been three months. Oh. And it was, I, I used the term discomfort because it wasn't pain at that point, but it wasn't fun. And it was really messing with my brain. Like literally right. the be- onset of shingles, I would walk into the room and be like... <laughs> forgot why I was in here. And then I would literally just roam around, try to figure out life. um, Like my mom used to do it. I was like, this is not cool. This is freaking me the heck out. Right. And then as the days would wear on, like at the end of the day, kind of like sundowning, I would get like, I don't know. It wasn't sundowning. It was more like bitchy. It just. And when you're more tired, things hurt more. You know, yeah, then then she recommended the gabapentin after three months, and I'm like, no, that's what I should have taken three months ago. Yeah, I'm not I'm not interested in a narcotic at this point. It just well, it's not it narcotic. was narcotic. Oh, it's not a narcotic. I thought no, it was a nar- anti seizure medicine. That's interesting. I thought the vet told me it was a narcotic. Maybe no, it was for not. the dog. The vet, the vet was confused, or it's not. Um, there's Norco and there's Tramadol. Tramadol is a popular um narcotic alternative but that can make elders sedated and confused so i've I've heard of tramadol but i don't know why (laughs) what's really interesting is each case is very different that's why you know i do telemedicine for folks in this um california uh area uh but i do telehealth because each person you have to kind of listen to what's going on and figure out for that person what works And then I um, write up a report to send to their doctor to to kind of give them a geriatrician's point of view, Um, since there's only 3,500 of (laughs) us in the whole country. (laughs) That's I would think we would need almost that many just in California. They say that we need at least 20,000. So there are 7,000 geriatricians, but only half of them are practicing full time. So. Hmm. 
That's 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 not I'm not good at math and I I'm I can tell that's not a very good number. No. So no, no. I have a question based on what you just said. Yes. So if you're caring for somebody with moderate to more advanced stage of some form of dementia mm -hmm. and you suspect or for whatever reason you you feel like their medications need to be reviewed, what kind of things should they like bring to the call, so to speak? Like um, I did tell my doctor with the shingles that it was affecting my, me my mental state. I mean, right. I knew what to tell her and she still didn't help me, <laughs> but it, well, it's like, yeah. I should have told her it was affecting me cognitively. And I was almost 55 at the time. So it's like, give me a break. My brain is fine. It's just this shingles is really messing with me. <laughs> right. Cause it's, it's, you know, causing inflammation of your nerves. Um, I think, so there's there's two parts to that. There's what should you bring to the call? And then there's what should the doctor do? And if they don't, how do you get a different doctor? You know, people are like, how do you how do you tell a doctor to, you know, do something different? And I'm like, you don't, mm. <laughs> you know, you have to figure out what's the right doctor for you and your needs. So what you want to do is um, like if if someone has an elder and they have concerns about something happening. I need to know um, what's been going on for the last week or two, you know, what precipitating factors were going on before, you know, the symptoms started. Is there anything that makes the symptoms better? Um, and what have you tried so far? Uh, if there's a nurse or a facility involved, I want them to do vital signs and an assessment, you know, an exam. You know, listening to the patient, looking at the patient. Um, and also, you know, it's important to know what medications a person's on at that time uh, because the medications can have such a big effect. Is that just because it messes with the brain chemistry differently than somebody who doesn't have a dementia? Or is it an older brain that processes these drugs differently or both? So it's, it's, Several levels. So people can get delirious if something really bad happens to them, like a younger adult, they'd have to be poisoned with something like arsenic or, or, you know, be very hypoxic or have a bad head injury to become delirious. As you get older, you know, older gets, it's 15 years older than me, man, um, which means, you know, 70, uh, 80 your, your brain is more susceptible to, sometimes it can be dehydration, sometimes it can be constipation or uh, pneumonia or something like that, or a bladder infection. Um, and then people with dementia are the most sensitive. As I said, most people who take a sleeping pill don't withdraw after three days, but if you have dementia, you might. So the other thing that's important is that people with dementia um, should not have anticholinergic medications. So the nerve cells talk to each other uh, using choline. And if you uh, use an anticholinergic medicine like Tylenol PM, never take Tylenol PM, um, that blocks the nerve cell communication. People can be more confused and agitated. So uh, uh, there's a lot of over-the-counter meds that cause problems uh, from Zyrtec to Unisom. You know, the... Um, that, that happens, elders are more likely to be affected than younger adults. That's interesting. I just find the brain super fascinating. I wish I was more scientifically inclined and half my age, I might go into research. Well, so but... I got to ask, ask about the book then. So <laughs> I tried to, you know, not get too far into the weeds, but I did talk about the parts of the book. I, I mean, the parts of the brain. I did talk about the different kinds of dementia. Was that mm -hmm. helpful? Mm hmm I mean, after doing this podcast for four and a half years uh -huh. and, and my mom who had Alzheimer's for 20, I feel like I knew a lot of that stuff, but it is really helpful to have it all in one place uh -huh. because, you know, most caregivers don't have the opportunity to start a podcast to talk to people. And you could always tell what was on my mind based on the conversations I had with people because mm -hmm. it's like, my mom is doing X. Let me find somebody to help me explain this because I'm not the only one going through this. Right. So I've, and I'm still learning tons, which is great because then I know the audience is listening or learning. Uh -huh. 
it's okay. My brain's like, <laughs> there's like a that's lot okay. of stuff going on outside. Well, now I'm getting so, distracted. <laughs> so the other thing that's really difficult is it's hard to think and talk in a performance. I mean, that's a whole different thing than just having a conversation with a friend over coffee. You know, so mm-hmm. definitely a number of, of, of levels. I was wondering, was there anything about this book that was different than other books that you've read? Um, it was very comprehensive from like the beginning to the end, which other people, like you said, spouses, people that have been on the journey and live to tell the tale, as I like to say, mm-hmm. um, they write that, but they write that from the perspective of a caregiver. So yours is more the perspective, obviously, of a physician. Excuse me. And that's it's helpful. It was very it's an excellent book, especially for people at the very earlier stages, because you can you you kind of get an idea of the entire journey of, of a dementia causing mm-hmm. disease without all the horrible parts being, I mean, you know, they're coming, but you don't, you don't have to have it spelled out in black and white and, and, you know, gory detail for lack of a better term. And that, that helps. Cause I find a lot of books don't talk about that. That was the other reason I started the podcast was because my, after my dad passed away in March, 2017, we had to put my mom in memory care and it was like, I don't know what to do with this lady, like with visits and like, I didn't know how to be her caregiver. I only knew how to be her daughter. So I had to like learn like immediately. And it was hard because all of the traditional advice did not apply to her. Like she never really responded to music. She didn't rec- even I would the one of the very, very first episodes I did is I took a scrapbook my sister made of pictures of her and I at childhood. My mom didn't recognize any of those people. And we're talking 40 some odd years back. I'm like, right. where where can I connect with this woman? So right. I had not found books. Of course, this was in 2017. Had not found it. There's a, a lot that's changed, mm-hmm. but we still need a lot more. So your your book is definitely, it's a definite improvement over a lot of the ones that are out there. And Everybody needs something. It's just kind of like a, all humans are different. We all need kind of different books. So Right. So what I tried to do was I started the book from when things are changing, but you don't have a diagnosis. And I have a lot of little stories to kind of try and show how, you know, the different symptoms can play out. Um, I do go through a number of issues about pain, about, you know, mismedication, about where to get help, about, you know, the, how to do estate planning and advanced uh, directive planning, and then what to think about with hospice and what to look for in hospice. So so it's there along the line, but I guess, I yeah, reading the 36-hour 36 uh, 36 day, that was pretty depressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my dad had that one. Don't know how much of it he read. Mm-hmm. I read that one, and that wasn't helpful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So well, I don't know if you're familiar with all's authors. But- actually, yeah, my mom had dementia and I, that is on my list to get to, but I, you know, I, my, my day job is being a doctor doing house calls for people with dementia, which means I spend 80 hours a week, at least working mm-hmm. to take care of them. So I haven't, I haven't done them yet, but yes, it sounds like a great group. Yeah. They're a fantastic group. And, um, I've, I interviewed all of the original founders, I think six of them Oh wow! early on in the podcast, because I didn't, once I ran out of the, all the people that were reasonably local to me, mm-hmm. um, then I had to branch out and I've been using zoom since September of 2018. So I'm an early zoom person Yeah. <laughs> and, but they have everything like you need children's books. You want something like your book, you want a, a fiction book. There's one called blue hydrangeas that I just mm-hmm. loved. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, this is us kind of story, mm-hmm. but just about a couple and it's touching and it's sweet mm-hmm. and it, but it still talks about Alzheimer's. So they're, they're one of my favorite sources. And I don't think they have the 36 hour day on there. And just for <laughs> reference, they actually wanted me to promote their book. And I said, sure. You know, and they said, okay, we'll contact you again. And they must've found out that I didn't like their book. So they didn't contact me again. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's so, okay. Yeah, so, so I like to promote, I like to promote books that don't make you want to run away. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. 
I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Well, thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm honored. I, so, so the idea that I had was to have a website where people can get you know, good information for free and then they can do the online training modules you know, for a modest uh, fee to get the certifications and get more teaching and then more intensive one-on-one -on -one video visits. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to pivot to do something else because I really hate to drive. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. So the part of the Bay Area, that San Francisco Bay Area that you're in is like, oof, no, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, driving is just pretty awful. But, you know, I, I very much enjoyed working with the elders, working with the families. And I think that the biggest thing that I would say is I hear a lot of doctors go, oh, it's dementia. There's nothing to do. Well, I, actually, on my um, website, either drlizgeriatrics.com or um, Elder Consult, I have a video on Bruce. So Bruce is kind of, you know, the I don't want to say poster boy, but, you know, the um, the guy of the year where he was brought to me in a wheelchair. He couldn't talk. He couldn't walk. He wasn't really eating. He was in a nursing home. He had been depressed. He tried to throw himself off a bridge. And then um, they took him to one of the local hospitals. They just gave him lots of psych meds and put him in a nursing home closer to home. They just left him there. And what I did was I started, of course, he's on Ativan. So I started tapering the Ativan and then we started changing other medications. He started eating, walking, and he went home. And then within a couple months, they went on a cruise. And then within five months, he was serving Christmas mass as a deacon and he has been living at home. So here's the kicker is that the cost to you know the system is at least 75% less because in the last four or five years, this man has lived at home. He's got a caregiver, but he just goes out to see the doctor now. He's not in a nursing home. He's not on hospice. And it was the medications. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that I want to put out there. I would say, you know, I see a couple cases every week where the elder is, you know, they look like they've got advanced dementia. But when you fix up the medications and take care of the pain, they are a lot more functional. They can enjoy their days um, and they often don't need, you know, the same level of care, you know, nursing home or, you know, a few people have gone from conserved and assisted living to home without a conservator. That's extremely unusual, but it's more common that they can stay home or they can be in a, a assisted living instead of going into a dementia unit or, or a nursing home. So I think that's a very important uh, bit that I'm hoping to, to share. Yeah, I think one of the things culturally we need to start shifting and shifting quickly is the immediate, we, the immediate want of a fix. Like we know we can't fix <laughs> Alzheimer's or other dementias, but, right. and I'm sure you've experienced this, you know, people go to the doctor, like, I feel like crap make me feel better. Right. And the easiest way to do that is with medication instead of, well, okay, let's see, your glucose is not good and your cholesterol is not good and you sit on your butt and you drink too much. So here's your six month plan. You're like, no, I want to feel better now. <laughs> Well, so you know, it's not just on doctors. That's a very good point in that, you know, what I hear is I, I want to fix the behavior right now. So the, the quickest thing to do is give them Ativan and they chill for a while until they become tolerant to the Ativan and they're even more agitated. Um, but also, 
you know, I'm disappointed that there are medical doctors out there who have had medical school training who are selling um, supplements as a cure for dementia. You know, a 36 point plan, which has not been proven there. I mean, I can say I cured Bruce's dementia. Well, I didn't because it was the medications that were the problem. Um, the only two supplements that really are helpful is vitamin D for your bones, vitamin B12 for um, your nerves and, and balance. And we need to change how we think of dementia. We, we aren't going to get, you know, the silver bullet to cure it. We need to think of it like emphysema, that it's scarring, whether it comes from vascular disease or Alzheimer's. But as you said, you know, the good news is that starting today, you know, if we have a plant-based diet, if we have, you know, 30 minutes of exercise a day, if we don't smoke, if we really limit and probably better to not have any alcohol, um, we can cut our risk of dementia by over 50%. So if there was one doctor I was going to follow for how to prevent dementia, it would be Dr. Shurzai. It's actually two doctors who are neurologists and they have the studies to show this. Um, I have information in my book too about this, but um, that's not as much of my focus. But it is really disappointing where you hear, you know, I cure everything from psoriasis to erectile dysfunction with celery juice. I mean, that's the guy who says he uh, was visited by the spirit and can diagnose and heal better than doctors, you know, and he's using vitamin C to prevent um, COVID, which it doesn't work that way, you know, masks, masks, and then keeping your distance work the best, but, um, and vaccines, we just need the new vaccine um, <laughs> that, you know, grass fed beef. I love steak. We have steak a couple times a year. It's expensive. And animal um, saturated fat is not great for your brain. Um, so grass fed, there's, I've heard so many times it's like, yes, you should have, you know, vegetables and grass fed beef, or you should have keto. Well, the saturated fat is not good for you. The plant-based fats, you know, like avocado oil, olive oil, canola oil, those are better for you. Um, so we, we can, like you said, you know, you cut the sugar, limit, uh, control your weight, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your cholesterol, and you can stay healthier and stronger. So, I mean, it sounds like you've been doing a great job. <laughs> well, I started back in 2009 ish, 10, 10 was when it was like, okay, this is, this is a thing that I'm doing mm -hmm. to lose. Cause I weighed, I'm five foot two and I weighed mm -hmm. at least 250 pounds. No way. Yes. I lost over a hundred pounds and I kept wow. 90 of it off for three years. Then I hit 50. My dad was in the hospital and then all of from 2016 to 2020, 2020, 2021. Whew, what, what a wild ride that was. Wow. Well, you look terrific. I mean, Thank you. you know, A, you don't look 50. You look 40 something and that's B, good because I'll be 56 in November. <laughs> well, and B, I can't imagine you ever being more than if you're petite, you know, 130, 140. It's, I don't see it in your face, honey. <laughs> Yay. So the Peloton is working, but good. I did that because, and you're, you're going to love this mm. as a photographer. I had a client who was a doctor mm. and she, I don't know how we got on the topic. It's uh, typical of me, I suppose, but we were talking about my, Dad's side of the family has a tremendous amount of diabetes, yeah. all male, which is interesting. Yeah. I don't know if there's a any kind of hint there. Well, but she looked at men me. Men don't take care of themselves. <laughs> my paternal grandfather did, but he still had problems. But oh. you never know. Anyway, my dad, no, he did not take care of himself. But she told me, she goes, "You have a family history of diabetes. You're overweight. You're screwed." Now, a lot of people might take offense to that term, "screwed." Yes, my. Uh, competitive nature went, I'll show you. And I did. I'm like, I'm not getting diabetes because this is this disease is a pain in the ass. Right. So I'm sorry, not going there. So, for, and I knew my mom was not doing well mentally. Right. Um, this was prior to 2005 because we, my parents, we had our family business together and they retired in early 05. Mm -hmm. So this must have been like three or four. So it took many, you know, it took a while to figure out what worked that I could do all the time because, you know, my knees are not great. Right. I'm like, cause I was overweight. 
to walking the dogs every day and pounding on the pavement. You know, like I would do it every day and then, oh, my knees are killing me. So then I do it every other day. Well, that's not very helpful. So it took me a while to figure out what to do. And now I actually get like physical anxiety if I don't work out. It is so bizarre. Well, no, 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 no. So endorphins <laughs> are your own. I mean, the oh, we have to talk about cannabis then. <laughs> Okay. Because it's your own <laughs> and endorphins, it's your own kind of, you know, endo narcotics, whatever. I, I am the same way. If I'm stressed, you know, if I've had a bad day, I'm not going to, you know, make dinner. I'm going to go for a walk, you know, and then I'll have a salad just because I want my walk. And I, it has to be like six miles um, and or or some strenuous workout to get the high, you know, you can't just go a half a mile and go, oh, that's fine. You, you need to work out enough to get the high. So I'm very impressed. So what did you do with your diet? Because that's terrific. I mean, that's, that, that is the one thing that people should be thinking about to prevent dementia. So you did it. That's mm -hmm. bad. Well, so the only nutritional change that worked, mm -hmm. keep the weight off was mm -hmm. to just go extremely low fat. So the recommended daily allowance for women is 65 grams of fat. Okay. I was at 30 or less, which is a challenge because if you like to eat eggs, which are healthy, I believe, yeah. you can correct me if I'm wrong, you get like a couple of eggs and then you're halfway through your da daily fat right. intake and egg whites do not fill you up. So. No, they don't. Can you, d could you have had, oh my goodness, I see an elk out the window. How interesting. Mm. Um would you have had um, bread and pasta and those things, or is I, I shifted? We weren't we weren't like a white bread family, which yeah. sounds funny because I mean we are technically like physically, but right. we didn't eat that garbage. Right. Um, I loved sourdough, which is definitely white but different. Right. To probably ninety five percent of my starches are whole grain, well, and as I'm getting older. I have less taste for meat. Like there's times when it's like, ugh, I'm I good. don't want any more chicken. And I've recently <laughs> had guests and Dr. Elizabeth and I have a mutual friend. This wasn't one yeah. of the guests, but I served them. Um, it was, well, it was the cashew Alfredo. Mm -hmm. Now I can't, I don't think the pasta had any meat on it. Mm -hmm. Now I can't remember, but it would no. have been like chicken breast, but it was like, the Alfredo sauce made from the cashews oh, was wow. better because it wasn't greasy and heavy. You got the nice yeah. Alfredo-y taste and not the whole, I ate garbagey stuff. Right. So the only drawback to my nutrition is that I cannot eat in restaurants more than once a week. It does not do my system any favors. Well, the, but the, yeah, that's, that's okay because that's not probably the place to find the healthiest stuff. So, you know, the more you uh, incorporate, actually, there's some really lovely um, vegetarian meals like a uh, Yotem Odalengi. It makes these, he's got this cookbook called Plenty. You can do really interesting stuff with vegetables. So I've, I've gotten pretty excited about that. I've also, um, as I've aged, learned that I like more veg, like I like roasted broccoli, whereas as a, child teenager bleh, did not like broccoli right so there's certain things like my daughter i had dinner with my daughter the other night she's cleaning up her nutrition because some of the weight i lost she found which is frustrating mm -hmm. as a parent but part of it is also the crohn's and she's like well I, what did she oh we had squash zucchini and squash mm -hmm. and she's like i know you weren't really a big fan of the broccoli cauliflower mix i'm like well roasted broccoli i could do i i, I enjoy that pretty much not as much as I enjoy other things, but mm -hmm. um, I said, you know, I should try roasted cauliflower just because I haven't. And maybe it will be better. It's mm -hmm. I just find it interesting that your taste buds, quote unquote, change as you age. They, they definitely do. Actually, there was one more thing I wanted to bring up um, about the medications and mm -hmm. elders with dementia uh, that I hear a lot. Is, so one thing that people do need to understand is that you can have paranoia and delusions, which is called psychosis only from dementia. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, hugs, not drugs, uh, or, you know, oh, if you just, if the family just, you know, met their needs, if the facility just took care of things, if they knew how to do it, this person would not have delusions and paranoia. And that's not true. 
um, the American Psychiatric Association uh, did a review of all the studies looking at the treatment of agitation in dementia in 2016. And they you know, had recommendations of get rid of the wrong meds, treat pain, um, use the beers list for medications that are not recommended for the use in elders. That's on our website, drlizgeriatrics.com. But sometimes if you have agitation um, and paranoia and someone you know, has either quick anger or they're paranoid and delusional. I had one guy who, you know, he tried to choke someone and he's escaped a couple times. Um, you need antipsychotics. You know, that is, I do want to get into that bugaboo before I leave um, because you're going to hear a lot of people saying, oh no, antipsychotics don't work. And antipsychotics are only to sedate and antipsychotics are only if the caregiver doesn't know what they're doing. Well, I will say that I have heard doctors say, no, we want to just give them sedating medications if they're agitated. It's like, no, we don't. No, we want to keep them alert and engaged. And the first thing we want to do is, you know, get them doing things that they enjoy, have them in a supportive environment, not too much stimulation, not too much boredom. Um, but if they are really aggressive and delusional and psychotic, maybe a little antipsychotic, maybe a little mood stabilizer, maybe a little bit of antidepressant. And I think I see so many elders who are like, mom's just horrible. I'm just putting her in a nursing home because she's just really mean to me all the time. And I'm like, no, 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 we can fix this. You know, we can get rid of the wrong meds and you can give her the right meds. And, you know, I would say at least 96% of the people that I've worked with can be alert and calm. And, you know, as, as you were saying, it's not a silver bullet to get rid of the dementia, but you can help the elder, you know, enjoy their life for that day. Living in the moment, baby. Mm. This, which is which, is what I did with my mom. Fortunately, my mom didn't have any of that. I don't. Great. I don't. I know. If twenty years, and the the worst part was when we moved to memory care. Um, it took about six weeks to acclimate. Those six weeks were a living hell for everybody. Right. But once she acclimated, she never had the exit seeking. Nice. Um, just yeah, she was pretty easy until the last nine months of her life. And then the more help she needed, the more irritated she got. And she liked to claw people, which wasn't cool. Well, so that's of- when I that's when I come in and I would, you know, look at what's going on, look at what medications they're using, and then say, you know, is she in pain, you know, when they try and turn her? And the, you know, the reason you would know is if you try and turn her into change her and she start hitting people, she's probably in pain treat the pain first before you give her, you know, Ativan or psych meds to, to treat the behaviors. Um, or it may be that she is having brain changes and she does need something to take that, you know, irritability off. It was probably that cause she was ambulatory with no AIDS until the okay. day she broke her leg. She oh, broke okay. her leg March 8th and mm-hmm. she died March 31st, which mm-hmm. I have told many people, well, thankfully, I mean, March 31st, 2020, hoo right, hoo. Did we dodge a giant anyway. bolt? Yeah, yeah, we do- and her uh, care fees were going to go up by like twenty five percent starting April first. So I think my mom literally probably had a minute or so of clarity where she said, "Hmm, I'm bed bound. Going to have to use this wheelchair. There's this virus thing going on. The mm-hmm. memory care residence is locked down. Nobody's come to see me for two weeks. Uh, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> oh yeah, I the fees you. going up. I mean, it's just." There was no way she would have tolerated any of that. Well, there is a lot of controversy about if someone breaks a hip and they've got more advanced dementia. I'm a huge fan of, and I've seen it both ways. Um, And I I have heard that if you keep people um, and don't move their leg, uh, that it can heal up. I mean, if you you keep their leg stable, but I've also seen it where it hadn't been displaced. And then because they moved them side to side, it got displaced. And then the person was in a lot more pain that well, I've had good luck with having them just put a nail in, put a pin in, mm-hmm. you know, at the hospital, you, you go in, they can do it pretty quickly. They can bring them back and you're not expecting them to move, but you've stabilized the fracture. So, so that's where I've come down. I mean, you know, there, it's, it's a huge area of controversy and you've got a number of people saying, Oh, they're so advanced. Why, why do anything? But I have had pretty good luck. You know, it's it's a pretty quick procedure. It's not like the big hip replacement. Um, and it, when you say it's palliative, then they they kind of get it more. So and this but was her like, her tibia right under the knee under the knee. So it wasn't well, her hip. I don't know how they would have fixed that. 
Yeah, easily. that's more complicated. That's that's definitely a more complicated thing. I'm not going to opine on that. You know, <laughs> I, I there, there's things that happen to us, and it sounds like what a gift you gave her all along the way. You know, and you're right. COVID was horrible for the elders. You know, I yep. had one facility where they did a nice job of having activities and they were testing, but they didn't kind of put everyone in lockdown. And there were 25 people out of 40 in the community that died. So Ooh. it was it was a horrible year. I'm, yeah, I'm her community was, I don't think they had an extraordinary amount of people die. Good. Um, they, I mean, I only saw them twice after mom died, the May mm -hmm. and then October of mm -hmm. 20 mm -hmm. um it was extraordinarily rough on them um but they had had a preview the previous winter they had a really huge flu outbreak in the assisted yep. living part of the community the where bad, they had to close the year. dining room yeah so they had that like a trial run right <laughs> which right, is not, right. not great so I, i'm gonna ask one last question okay. um, i've had some conversations with people that have made me think that this might be an answer a temporary answer Okay. Until we can get better help. But because there's no cure for Alzheimer's or other dementias, yes, there is getting their medications in order and, and mm -hmm. learning how to manage the disease so that their care is best. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't help the care. I mean, it does help the caregiver a little bit. But what are you what are your thoughts on when a family gets a diagnosis of say Alzheimer's like mine did? It's mm -hmm. just immediately putting that person and their family into palliative care. My, my top of my mind math, and again, I can't do math great. Right. I would think that you would save money on hospitalizations and over medication that would then hopefully cover the cost of the palliative care. Is that, am I being too basic um, or is that a well, thought? It's different, different pots of money. You know, the government's, uh, <laughs> so host, I've been, I, I've, I've been boarded in internal medicine, geriatrics, palliative care, um, and I've been a hospice medical director. You have to meet criteria for um, a prognosis of six months or, or less to be in hospice, to be palliative care. Uh, I think it's a little different. I think you have to go with the goals of care because the other thing I've seen and, you know, I, I kind of address is that. You know, people who've got the dementia, they might have a house. They probably have assets. There's family members who are like, I want my part now. And I've seen them say, no, we're not going to do anything for mom because, you know, like she's old. But she's like, but I want to go to the, you know, the day program. And there was one gentleman who'd had a pneumonia. Uh, his He was too sedated with his meds, which could easily be changed. They changed the meds. They started giving him IV antibiotics, but then they stopped and put him on hospice and just gave him morphine. He had two daughters who were nurses and a second wife who had a little cognitive problems herself. Um, and the daughters were like, you know, dad wants to get back to his community. He wants to go to bingo. They don't want to have comfort care. Um, so I let the hospice know they had an ethical issue because the guy was aware and he's like, yeah, I want to go to bingo. It, it, it it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge discussion. I think that, up front, you have to have the discussion with the family. And if someone is really failing, if they look like they're you know, not likely to live more than six months, they should definitely be on palliative care. Uh, I think we should always be looking palliatively to treat pain and think about, you know, even if uh, someone doesn't look like they won't, well, like with your dad, if he had more dementia, you know, think about someone, who, think about your mom having the dementia she did but needing dialysis, you know, and if you're not going to have a procedure done, don't let the doctor take you down that road, you know, to, to do a lot of invasive things. So I, I think it, it definitely takes a village. Um, as I said, have the family meeting, have the care manager. I think that's good. I would call the Alzheimer's association looking for a doctor who might be more, you know, in tune with people with dementia, look for um, a medical school with a geriatric division. We do telehealth at drlizgeriatrics.com and, um, you know, check in with you and find <laughs> out <laughs> the, the newer things. I didn't mention about the cannabis. Cannabis uh, has THC and can make people more confused and agitated. Sometimes CBD can be helpful, but it's not a cure-all and it does not cure dementia. No. <laughs> no. Fortunately, nothing does, but like we were talking about lifestyle changes, 
You know, like my mom had Alzheimer's. My mm-hmm. maternal grandmother had vascular dementia, probably mm-hmm. mixed dementias, but for sure mm-hmm. vascular. And my maternal great grandmother had dementia. So it's like, oh, hello. I better do, you know, after lo- going on the weight loss journey to avoid diabetes, which I have done. Um, now it's now I continue this journey because one, it's more fun. And, you know, because I can do a lot more things and I feel better. But it also I know that, you know, if there's. Uh, you know, like a time bomb in my head that's going to go off. And I, you know, obviously my my risk for the disease is higher than the average person, but I'm doing all these things to lower my risk. So maybe I won't get dementia until I'm 90, which well, would be okay. <laughs> you are a walking advertisement for what you should do. I mean, you didn't spend, you know, some of these doctors will make it say that you have to spend $10,000 in six months, that you have $5,000 of all these testing that really doesn't uh, change the outcome. And then they want you to take, you know, I've had to uh, take care of a number of these families. And, you know, often they would want the elder to be taking 30 supplements a day. I mean, I think it can help with anxiety. It's like, oh, they know what they're talking about and I'm doing things. But you are, you know, the advertisement of, you have literally cut your risk of dementia by over 50%. So um, that is amazing. There are no pills, zero. Mm -hmm. There are no pills that can do it. I mean, and you, you know, if you can evangelize and get that message out, and if you can, if we can get the message out, you know, to, I I come from Kansas and, you know, they're very generous with the portions there, you know, and the breakfast burrito is pretty much as big as my head. And then they want to give you, you know, the little cinnamon bun to go with it. And we've got to work on the portion control and the exercise. And you've done it all. That's I'm I'm very impressed because I have trouble losing five pounds. <laughs> it does get harder as we age. That's not fair. But my paternal grandmother lived to 103 with most of her mental capacity intact. It was the last nine months of her life. Seems to be mm-hmm. a number that she was having many strokes, I believe, um, yeah. because that's what essentially took her out. She was on virtually no medications. Mm-hmm. She did have glaucoma. Um, so I, I cite is, you know, blind, most, bl- mostly blind from glaucoma. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, and then she got hard of hearing, which that did not help her cognitive health at all mm-hmm. in my humble opinion, but yeah, no. Um, and I know how she, she definitely ate smaller portions. I think she needed to, the one thing she needed to do was, exercise better and eat a little bit more protein to Mm -hmm. ward off um, frailty. Yep. I think that's all great. Um, Thank you so much for letting me talk about, you know, my work and my book. And I do have an ask if anyone (laughs) does buy the book, can you please just write a little blurb on Amazon? I am not a known quantity. So people look at like, Oh, 500 people have read, you know, 36 hour day and 15 have read, you know, living in the moment. So if you can, if you do get the book, it's also on Kindle and it's on Audible. Um, leave a little uh, blurb about it or or reach out to us at drlizgeriatrics.com and tell us what you need. We're, we want to be there. And, you know, Jennifer, I would like to connect and see how can we get out low cost, you know, information to the areas that don't have many doctors. I mean, that is kind of, you know, one of my interests these days. Well, I've- Oh, it will definitely do that in the coming months. And the website is doctor spelled out or just DR? No, just D-R-L-I-Z-G-E-R-I-A-T-R-I-C-S dot com. That'll be, yeah. that'll be linked in the show notes so you guys don't have to spell it. But I'm sure you can remember it because she's told <laughs> it to you a dozen times. And it's great yeah. because we definitely need this kind of information. So I appreciate this. Again, the book is excellent. It's very comprehensive and it's easy to read. So those are usually mutually exclusive. So you did a great job and I appreciate you coming on today. And then we'll reconnect and do again on how to get help. Well, you've, you've, you know, got me very excited to make my own (laughs) health better. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Have a good day. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.